Hey, good morning and welcome to church here at Geyer Springs. I'm Brad Franklin. We're really glad you're with us today. Good morning, I'm Sarah Camps. Good morning, I'm Mandy Horton. Hey, I'd like to tell everyone about an exciting summer event we have, Camp Geyer and Camp Geyer Junior. This event will take place on June 3rd through 6th from 9 a.m. to noon. Camp Geyer Junior is available for kids entering kindergarten and completed kindergarten. And Camp Geyer is available for kids first through fifth grade. We'd love to have your kids join us for this fun field week. We are so excited for Camp Geyer and Camp Geyer Junior and all the activities that the kids will get to take part in in this fun field week. Kids will be able to take part in worship, music, games, crafts, Bible story, and mission times. And we would love to have you as a church join us this summer. First of all, you can pray for God's work in and through Camp Geyer and Camp Geyer Junior. If you know of people to invite to join us to be a part of what God's gonna do here, extend that invitation. And then finally, go to gsfbc.org slash Camp Geyer to find places to volunteer and also to register your children. Thanks for joining us today. Let's worship together. We're going to begin our day with a great song about testimony, how much Jesus has done for us. Let's stand and sing to him this morning. And I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven. Not believe in signs and wonders. Not have resurrection power. See the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. Let's sing this air. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. But Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. But 
as you take your seat, please. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Just a second. There it is. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited as we have the opportunity to kick off uh, our service with an amazing time of worship, but then also uh, with a baptism. My name is Casey Winstead. I'm the lead student pastor here at Geyer Springs. This is my friend Peyton. Everybody say, hey, Peyton. There we go. There we go. And we asked, uh, when we do uh, baptisms, it's such a special thing to see what is taking place, but also to hear the stories. And so uh, to hear Peyton's story, we have asked them to share that. And this is his father sharing his story. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Peyton Sykes. I'm senior in a, at Bryant High School. When I was eight, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I said that Jesus was the Lord of my life. However... I never followed through with his words. I called myself a Christian, but I did not outwardly express it. This year at lunch, I started sitting with a new group of friends. When we first sat down at lunch together, they asked me if I would like to join them in praying over the food with them. We also talked about the Bible and God. This moved me spiritually, and it opened my eyes to the way I was living. I realized that I wanted to live a life through God. About three weeks ago, after Sunday school, I stopped Miss Lynn, my Sunday school teacher. I asked her to pray with me to rededicate my life to God. I also knew that I needed to follow through with a believer's baptism. Since then, I am more openly talking about God. I've started a Bible devotional, and I have felt better about my life as I know that the Lord is with me. I'm excited for my future as I head off to college. And the Bible verse that I picked out today is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. I love that. As a, as a student pastor, um, we have a limited time with students. And so I'm thankful for people like Lynn who are coming alongside and uh, all, all our adults who lead out. But Peyton, next month you graduate high school and after that you go to college. And so uh, that is a transitioning time in your life and a season where you have some th new things to experience, and I'm so thankful for your obedience to God, uh, your willingness to say, I'm going to sit with new friends, uh, and let that be a challenge to us. And some of our lifestyle choices might need a change, but because of the change, man, we could experience some far greater things. And so, Peyton, I want to have you turn around here. Have you indeed invited Jesus into your heart? I did. And you want to follow him in all that you do? Yes. And it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, good morning. good morning. It's so good to see you guys this morning. We are glad that you are here with us in worship. My name is Curtis Barnes. I'm the family discipleship pastor, and we love uh, baptisms. It's an exciting way for us to be able to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives. We also love the fact that you are here with us today. So let me ask you to take your bulletin that you should have gotten on the way in. A couple of notes on here. First, uh, for uh, everyone here today, there's a small tab on the end of that bulletin. If you would go ahead and pull that tab off, if you're a guest, we'd appreciate uh, getting just a little bit of information from you today. We want to follow up, ask about your visit, ask about next steps, see what we can do for you, how we can connect you to what's going on in the life and the work of Geyer Springs First Baptist Church. There's a lot happening, and so we would love for you to be a part of that. We'd love to answer any questions uh, that you may have, help you connect to a small group, or take whatever step uh, you would like to in checking out Geyer Springs and what the Lord is doing here in our church. Also, you'll notice in your bulletin today, there's a new member insert. Uh, these are people who recently uh, joined our church, and so if you see them and know them, give them a hug. 
hug, give them a fist bump, a high five, whatever you're comfortable with. Tell them welcome uh, to the family here at Geyer Springs. And you'll notice that in a couple of weeks, we're having another Discover class. So if you're exploring membership, praying through that, you can come to Discover. You don't have to join that day, but that's the, the class to find out who we are, what we do, how things function around here at Geyer Springs. So we'd love to have you come and be a part of that in a few weeks. You'll also notice in your bulletin, we have a young adult pastor candidate coming in about two weeks. We are super excited to welcome Ryan and Amanda Gilchrist uh, to come. Uh, you have a call on that weekend, so we're excited about what the Lord has done in bringing them to this place at this time. So uh, we would uh, point you to the bulletin for several other things happening here in the work and the life of Geyer Springs. So we're glad you're here today. It's a big weekend around our state, right? I hope you're still there, because if you put these things on, you cannot see anything. But apparently, that's good for tomorrow. Listen, I'm a child of the 80s, so these paper glasses like this, I go way back with them with 3D movies and stuff, right? So, yeah, we've been around. Tomorrow's going to be a big day, from what they say. Who knows, right? As we think about tomorrow, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know if it's going to be sunny tomorrow, right? We don't know what the highways are going to be like. We don't know what the restaurants are going to be like. We have no clue what tomorrow holds, right? But man, I'm so thankful that we know who holds tomorrow and the day after and the day after, right? I mean, the, the creator who created the sun, the moon, the stars, numbered them, named them, set them in their orbits. He knows all things. He controls every detail and every detail of our lives as well. So that's who we are here to worship and uh, to celebrate today. So we're thankful that you're here with us. As we continue in worship, I'm going to ask our uh, offering bearers if they would come. And uh, if you're taking up offering, find your spot and go ahead and begin receiving that. I'm going to invite Ron Simpson, if he would, to come onto the platform. As we think about God's Word and what it teaches us about this God who controls all things uh, on the earth and in the heavens and the stars, uh, we're here today. Uh, Ron Simpson is with Gideon's International, and uh, you may be familiar with the Gideon ministry as they put God's Word uh, in lots of places around the world. And so they're going to share about that today. So we're thankful for their work and their ministry and sharing God's Word with people. And he's going to share a little bit more about their work and what they do. But he'll also tell you there's a table in the foyer today. So if you would like more information about how to give or how to be a part of that, that ministry and that organization, you can stop by there after the service. So Ron, thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Divine appointments arranged by the Holy Spirit take a lot of forms. Quite often they defy human understanding. Deborah Murkerson thought she had everything in life, a great marriage, beautiful son, nice home, good job. Then one day it all came crashing down. Her husband said he no longer wanted to be married to her, and she and her son were out of her beautiful home and on their own. Now Deborah's job was the county clerk in her area. The marriage had been over for just a few days when she received a call from her ex-husband, said he and the girlfriend wanted to get married, but they were running behind. Could she stay over and issue the marriage license? She did, but by the time she got home to her department, she was so despondent she couldn't even walk. She crawled through the building to the nightstand in her bedroom where she kept her handgun. She couldn't face the shame of going on. Now, we all know people who are devastated by the hurts of life, don't we? When she reached into the drawer where her gun was kept, her hand instead came out with a little red Gideon New Testament that her son had been given in school. It wasn't supposed to be there. She had no idea how it arrived. When she opened it to her surprise, her eyes fell on Psalm 34. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. God had her attention. She read for several days from that scripture, and the following Sunday she went to a local church, made a profession of faith in Christ. Today, Deborah is a pastor's wife and serving the Jesus that she met in that little book. The Gideons International, most simply put, is a few men of the church, business and professional men, working together and taking the message of the church to a lost and dying world. We strive side by side for the faith of the gospel with Geyer Springs First Baptist Church and others all over the world. The word strive literally means fight. And folks, you know we're very well. We're in a fight with the principalities trying to control this world. Our goal is to reach those outside the church and compel them to come in. Our method is personal witnessing. And as we have opportunity, we place copies of God's word into the hands of people. Last year, with Gideon's distributed nearly 60 million scriptures, which was down from pre-COVID years, but the open doors are rapidly climbing again. We're organized in 199 countries of the world, distributing scriptures in 109 different printed languages. Now, if you were asked who the Gideons are, most of you would say, oh, yeah, those are the Hotel Bible guys. But you might be surprised to learn that Hotel Bibles are only about 7% of our annual scripture distributions. 
Isaiah 55, the Lord spoke to the prophet. He said, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose, succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You see, personal evangelism and distributing God's word works because God says it will. So this morning, I'm asking you to pray for the word to transform the nations of the world. And hear me now, pray that the word will transform our nation. You and I live in the third largest mission field on the planet. We live in a country that needs Jesus. And second, I'm speaking to the business and professional men of Geyer Springs Church. Would you please consider praying about joining this ministry? This is a call for you to get out of the pew and come to the front row of kingdom expansion for Little Rock as well as the world. Men, I ask you, are you fulfilling God's purpose in your life? Are you impacting the kingdom in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth? Are you impacting the kingdom in Little Rock, Pulaski County, Arkansas, and the United States? Do you feel a longing to have a greater capacity to reach people for Christ? We can help see that accomplished. Gideon's International is a great ministry for couples as well as the wives of Gideon's greatly assist us in the distribution of God's Word. They go places that we can't go, domestic abuse centers, crisis pregnancy centers, women's jails and prisons, as well as the medical profession. Now, if you're one of those guys sitting out there right now and your wife is kicking your leg, that can mean only one of two things. She's saying, don't you dare add something to your schedule. Or she's saying, you need to go talk to that guy because I've got a burden for the kingdom as well. Brothers, we need you because there's so many more doors opening. It's amazing. We promise to coach you to engage everyone very effectively for the faith of the gospel. And let me make this perfectly clear. There is no time requirement for those who participate. I personally found the spiritual disciplines help us strengthen our spiritual character in ways that is amazing. We have a table set up in your welcome center. Be happy to speak to you with after the service if the Lord might be calling you to investigate this. Thank you, Brother Jason, for allowing my family to worship with you, preparing me, permitting me to share my heart this morning. Thank you. Stay in the same church. How I long to breathe the air of heaven. There she fills the streets, yes, to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and every prayer we pray to desperation the songs of
found in you and you alone. And we thank you for that um, as we got to witness another person this morning saying their identity is not in themselves but in you. Um, God, may that uh, remind the believers in the room of the faith that they have in you uh, and encourage them to keep on going. Um, God, to, to spread your word. God, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity uh, to worship you freely, God, and to sing praises to you and the fact that you listen and to dive deeper in your word so we can become more like you, God. Because that's our mission here on this earth. In the name we get to pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Good morning. Don't worry, the security team has vetted my backpack. We're fine. Nothing to see there. So glad to see you guys here today. It is the week after Easter, which means it's the National Associate, Associate Pastor Week to Preach. Very excited about that. Today, you guys are starting to wonder, when are those days? I'll let you know. I do want to just say a thank you to Ron and the Gideon Ministry. What a great opportunity uh, for us just to be reminded of the incredible, incredible work that they do to get the word out. And so I just want to be praying for you. Uh, please stop by the table if you are at all uh, pricked by today, um, your heart stirred. I want to encourage you. Uh, to gather more information, just see what God may be doing in you, in your life, or your family, opportunities to serve. It's incredible. Thank you, Tim and Andrew. Appreciate you guys and your, your ministry and your leadership over us as we worship. I just want to give a quick update about Next Steps. Uh, we've been uh, walking through an anniversary, and so a couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to say, hey, thank you, Lord. We're so excited about what God's doing here at Geyer Springs. We want to continue the journey. Some of you joined the journey in our one-year commitment. We had 31 new commitments. She said, hey, we want to not just give to Geyer Springs, we want to put our yes on the table and contribute in a unique and wonderful way. And so we just want to say thank you to that. Um, over our new commitments, that equals about $100,000 or so. And so for our total new commitments and those who increased, 
in our anniversary, $230,000 is represented. So we're so excited about what God is doing in Next Steps. Thank you for being faithful to that, and we're looking forward to that. Hey, if you're here today, because this was on the, your path of totality, we're just so glad you're here. Uh, we hope and pray you love Central Arkansas, and if you're from here, praise God to come back. If you're new, uh, we do wear shoes here in Arkansas, and so we're just glad you're here. And I don't know who you are, but we'd love to meet with you after service just uh, letting us know that you're around. If you have your Bibles today, open up to John chapter 4. So we're in a kind of a unique situation where I believe this generation is the most hydrated generation we have ever. And here recently in life, it's come to pass as I open up my cupboards, maybe you opened up your cupboards, it's full of cups. And I'm like, where did all these cups come from? Why are we so consumed with gathering all the water? So a couple years ago, the Tervis came out. You guys remember this, little plastic guy. And so it was all the rage that uh, mainly women throughout the world were gathering the Tervis cups. And so they were really excited about that. And then uh, Starbucks and others started gathering an idea. Hey, there's an opportunity here to market some unique cups. And then over time, some metal guys came out. And then, of course, we know the Yeti. The Yeti is all the important, the, kind of the cream of the crop there. And so I just think about all these cups that I see these people wearing. This is my daughter's. It's, it didn't come with all these stickers. These are, these are free. And then uh, the Stanley's, or because I can't afford one, the knockoff. Look at that giant thing. What are we doing? Why are we so consumed with water? My child left the other day with the water cup and uh, came back and said, hey, I forgot my water. And I said, what do you mean you forgot your water? I, he goes, I don't know where it is. I need to have it. Where's my water? Have you seen my water? And I'm like, are you going to the desert? I thought you were going to Target, right? So when I see my daughter or my wife or, or a minivan full of different variety of water liquid containers, I ask myself, you know, what are they really thirsty for? And I think that's a pretty unique question for our day and time, because in our heart, in our emotional state, we all have to ask ourselves that very question. What am I thirsty for? Is it love? Is it money? Is it accolade? Is it a 4.0 GPA, a state title, a promotion at work, a scholarship? Is it your looks? What are you chasing to satisfy your soul? We are all parched in some way, seeking something to quench our spiritual, our emotional, even our physical thirst. And there's a character in the Bible that was struggling with the same question, pursuing, chasing, thirsty for one thing, thinking it would satisfy, but in the end, she's still left empty. And so we're going to continue our, our series in the book of John. One of the major themes in the book of John is, is the idea of belief. That word believe is used 99 times in the book of John. And in fact, it's even expressed in the purpose of the book. John chapter 20, toward the end John writes the purpose of his writing here in verse 30. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe in Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20, 30. You know, John wrote about the account of Jesus' life, his burial, and his resurrection that people would simply believe. And John has all these accounts of all these different people in different circumstances, different scenarios to show that Jesus paves the way towards genuine, authentic, real faith. You know, even though we may be separated by thousands of years, our same hang-ups and heartaches were the same hang-ups and heartaches found in the Scripture. You guys may remember in John chapter 2, the spiritually impure and the pride and the selfishness ran rampant throughout the area. John chapter 3, Nicodemus is a spiritual leader, but his knowledge was not real, genuine faith. I've been there in my own life. John chapter 4, we're going to know about a woman, a woman who is at a famous well, who has an incredible encounter with Jesus, where she begins to understand both who he is and who she is, and then we, the reader, get to really a wrestle with who we are in light of this story. Now, if I were going to write John chapter 4 as a play, I would write it in three scenes. The first scene is the context, is the context. We're going to open up John chapter 4 starting with verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, 
Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near that field where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weird as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, there's a few novels that we all have read that have very distinctive, very opening lines. And these lines kind of set a plot for us. It's the reason we want to continue to read, turn the page. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And I asked the question, well, what made it the best and what made it the worst? C.S. Lewis's famous book, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, starts like this. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And this story is about something that happened to them while they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. And as a reader, I'm like, well, what happened? And then maybe one of my favorite opening lines from Herman Melville's Moby Dick call me Ishmael. Now, I'm not sure there's any plot in that, but if you've got the name Ishmael, you've seen some things, okay? So these first several verses really set up the plot of the story that's going to follow. Here's what we know. The work among the Jews is growing. The Pharisees are beginning to take notice. And so Jesus leaves Jerusalem, and he's headed north. He's going to go to Galilee. Now, there's two roads. He could have taken two routes. He could have taken an indirect route, which, which would have meant he would have gone west and followed the River Jordan, and then gone east again to enter the Galilee area. But Jesus didn't do that. He took a direct route, went due north, right into Samaria. Jesus is in Sychar, which tells us he's right in the middle of Samaria. Now, this is a big no-no for Jews. Usually, they take the indirect route, which takes them six days further journey to get from Judea into Galilee. But why would they do that? Why would they take the indirect route? Why would they avoid Samaria? Well, animosity between Jews and the Samaritans stretches back nearly a thousand years. About 900 BC, the northern part of Israel succeeded from the southern part of Israel, and they basically set up two nations and have their own capitals. The northern kingdom grew really unfaithful to God. And so in 722 BC, God punished them by sending the Assyrians to conquer them. Now, in those days, when you wanted to conquer an area, not only would you kill off all the men, but the problem with that is many of the children of those people would grow up hating you, and their grandchildren would grow up hating you, wanting revenge. So the strategy was pretty simple. Not only would you kill many people, but you would take many men, and you would take them back to your homeland, and there you would make them slaves or concubines. There you would teach them worldview and religion and customs. There they would intermarry with those who are nationals of that foreign land. And so essentially, you begin to lose your ethnic identity. Well, most countries that happened to them would just resist that integration, but not northern Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel did not resist at all. They just integrated right into Assyrians, and they syncretized religions. They put two worldviews together. Well, the problem there that that created, now southern kingdom of Israel thought that they themselves were the pure Israel. They were the ones that were not defiled by the Assyrian beliefs or the Assyrian families. They viewed the Samaritans as compromisers, as half-breeds. And so about 100 B.C., a renegade Jew by the name of Manasseh declares that all the Jewish places of worship in Jerusalem were corrupt. So he defects north to Samaria, and he begins to establish these new places of worship around some historic ancient sites. Well, one of those places is Jacob's well. And that's where the story takes place. So here we are. Jesus is at this historic worship site known as Jacob's well in Samaria talking to a woman. And he asks her a question. Now, this woman is not just any woman. Scripture says this woman's at a well at the sixth hour, which means it's noon. Now, I've been to the Middle East. You know what they don't do in the middle of the day? They don't work. It's too hot. We think it's hot here. It's not near as hot here as it is there. And so this clue tells us that this woman is choosing to avoid her community, choosing to avoid crowds because of some issue in her life. We know as the story opens up that this woman is a social outcast. So a chapter before, Jesus 
is spending time with a very wealthy, very respected religious leader in Nicodemus, and now he's spending time with this low-class, half-breed, forgotten person of their community. And this provides a backdrop that the truth is, the gospel is for all. And I might add, including you. The wealthy, the poor, the high, the lowly, the educated, the dumb, the Jew, the Gentile, the scriptures remind us as this story begins to open that the gospel is for all, including you. We're all in need of Christ. We're all in need of saving grace. And that helps provide this incredible context for the story that begins to unfold. Scene two, the chase. The chase, beginning in verse seven. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus' command is simple. Give me a drink. And her response is rather dumbfounded. She begins to explain to him what's already very obvious. Sir, why are you, a Jew, asking me, a woman from Samaria, for a drink? It doesn't make any sense because they didn't have anything to do with one another. The little line there that says they had no dealings with Samaritans is actually translated, they didn't share dishes. The idea is she's kind of dumbfounded. Why would we even speak to one another, let alone drink after one another? You don't have anything to draw water with. You're going to have to use something that I've brought. What you're asking is absolutely ludicrous. You're crossing some cultural barriers, some norms, some religious differences, all by simply asking me a question or asking me to give you a drink. And so Jesus responds, listen, lady. If you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Now, in the scriptures, and especially in the New Testament, it provides this, this illusion, this, this little idea of living water, it usually refers to the Holy Spirit. But of course, she thinks they're talking about water. So she says in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank it from himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but I think she's getting a little snarky right here. We might call the Samaritan woman a little sassy in this moment. Hey, buddy, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but you don't have anything to draw water. You think you know better than Jacob? Jacob, our father, he dug this well. He fed his livestock and himself. Surely if there were living water in this well, we all would have known about it. She is offended by what he is saying. But Jesus explains in verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus provides a two-part promise. Listen, if you drink of this water, you'll never be thirsty again. Your thirst will be quenched. And the second part is now you'll have continual access to this water. It will be a spring in you that never runs dry. Here's what Jesus is saying. The remedy for our parched souls is a living water that only Jesus can provide. Some evidence of faith in her response. She wants it, but I think she wants it for the wrong reason. So verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Now Jesus is starting to meddle. In verse 17, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So in the moment, it gets real. Jesus doesn't shy away from speaking about the magnitude of sin in her life. He directly points to it. 
But I think it's necessary. For in this moment, it probably begins to make sense to her, this water discussion, this living water, my thirst. He's saying he can quench it. The fact that he knew her present situation, it begins to all just make sense. So this woman comes daily to the well to have her thirst quenched day after day, over and over, always finding just a temporary relief for her thirst. And in the same way, this woman has gone to the well of romance, of relationships, to satisfy the thirst that's in her soul. Five husbands. I'm guessing each one she thought might be better than the one before Thinking that finally I'll get what I'm looking for, what I need, what will satisfy my heart. A marriage in the New Testament is different than marriage today. But certainly we can understand what she's going through. We can resonate with this. And all of a sudden it becomes painfully clear why she's an outcast, why she is at the well at noon. For now, she's just simply living with a man. And so it kind of begs the question, what's got you parched? What are you thirsty for? What cup or cups Are you drinking to quench the thirst that's in your life? My friend J.D. Greer says it this way, there's a soul thirst in all of us. We're drinking something that we think will satisfy, bring happiness, contentment, and pain, and take the pain away. What is it in you? You know, a couple examples are pretty true. Some of us might resonate with a Samaritan woman. Relationships are romance. We think we just have pursuit of someone in our life that will make us happy, that will satisfy us. Maybe, unfortunately, we're pursuing some temporary fix in our life. And so we find ourselves drinking, unfortunately, the realities of addictions. Maybe it's drugs or alcohol or pornography or gambling, something in us that we think that we can just have a little bit of it. It will make it all go away, make it just better. And that little something has turned into a big something in our life, and it's, it's ruining us but we can't stop drinking it. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's the chase after the ever elusive dollar. Maybe it's money. Maybe you think in your life, man, if I could just get a promotion, if I could just get that job, if we could just make that much money, if we could just get rid of that school debt or that loan or pay off our house, retire early or or go be able to do that, that, that will give us what we want. And so we spend endless hours chasing, dreaming, working hard, thinking that will satisfy. Maybe the opposite is true. I see this among families. We're chasing relaxation. We're working for vacations. We're always thinking about getting away, doing something else, moving away from the reality of having to work, the mundane in our life. And so we're chasing one vacation to the next, the lake, the river, Disney, Airbnb, Branson, the beach, and so on and so on. We think we can just work hard and then so finally we can just veg out and relax. And maybe it's not a big vacation, maybe it's a daily vacation that you're looking for. You get home and you're just mindless. You're just thinking, I don't wanna do anything, this is what's gonna fill me up if I could just sit here and relax. And one family member after another family member takes out their phone and starts to do the scroll. And two hours, three social media platforms, and four Netflix episodes later, You stand up in some sort of media drunk state, ready to finish out your day. This chase for the mindless relaxer. Maybe, maybe the thing that we're chasing that we think will satisfy us, and I'm going to talk to some parents in the room, is our kids. We're chasing our kids' happiness. And so we're we're thinking that, man, if my kids could just be the best kids, that will make me look better, feel better as a parent. And we, we, we all think that it's just because we're helping our child here, but really there's something about our willingness to, uh, to revolve our entire life around our kids' activities that has something to do more with us than it has to do with our kids. And so whether it's helicopter parenting or whether it's pushing your kids to unrealistic expectations, allowing your child's activities to dictate all of your free time, all of your free expending money, Somehow, I don't know when it happened, but reading a book to your toddler, turning into pushing them into academic success where they find themselves getting academic ulcers. Somehow playing catch with your son has turned into, we're gone 25 weekends a year, traveling thousands of miles, spending thousands of dollars for a competitive league play, fitting in church 
whenever our tournament schedule allows. Now, I know some of you didn't come here to get browbeat today. I get it. Can I just confess to you that I, was, I am and was one of those parents? I have three older kids that have all played competitive sports. I have traveled thousands of miles. I have spent thousands of dollars. I have spent more nights in hotels and watched more games than I care to even recount. I get the pressure. But I also get the adrenaline and the pride of tournament wins, championship medals, college scouts, and of social media accolades. I get it all. I have some high-achieving children, and I'm proud of them. But we got to make a choice as a family. Are we raising athletes or are we raising men? Are we raising athletes or are we raising women? God has called me as a parent not to make sure my kids are all happy all the time. They're getting all they want. God's called me as a parent to raise them up in the admission of the Lord, to teach them what is right and what's wrong, so that when they get old, they may not depart from it. Listen, parents, if you're chasing the tournaments, I get it. I'm with you. I understand that. Come find me. We can cry together about how much money we spent about it. I know. Can I just tell you that in parenting, there's no double elimination schedule. You get one shot at this. Because you're going to wake up one day, like I have, and your kids are 21, 20, and 18. And you're going to look back going, was it worth it? And I can't answer that for you. But what I can answer is this. Jesus Christ is the only thing that's going to satisfy your soul. So that's something we have to wrestle with. What are you seeking to quench your soul thirst? And that may be the most important question you've got to answer today. But would you be honest? Would you be thoughtful about it? Because here in a few minutes, we're going to have a time of response and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit just reveals that to you. And if it's not Christ or his word, you need to give that up to him and listen to him on how you can allow him to regain control of your life, that you would seek him to be the, thirst, the quencher of your thirst in life. Jesus reveals her dark secrets, and she responds in verse 19. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I, I might say, yeah, where you been? Okay, so verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So she deflects. She doesn't want to talk about her, her mistakes, her sin. She wants to keep the conversation about religion or theology or a controversial theological question. I have this happen to me all the time when I talk to people about Christ. They know I'm a pastor, and so they don't want to talk about their own issue. They don't want to talk about their own quest for what's right in their life. They want to talk about other issues, big theological issues, abortion, homosexuality, pastor failure, all these kinds of things. And I, I get that's, that's a, a heart full of questions, but we have to deal with the first question, which is this, is Jesus the water for your soul? Verse 21, Jesus doesn't let her get away with it. He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know the Messiah that's coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus revealed to her that he is Messiah. Jesus revealed to her that she is indeed the prophet that she's been looking for, the one she's been waiting for. And Jesus describes to her these two ideas of spirit and truth. He's describing not how we should worship. He's describing salvation. You see, the truth is a testimony about who Jesus is. And the spirit is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The question that we must wrestle with is, do I believe the truth of who Jesus is? And have I received the spirit, the Holy Spirit, in my life? Both are required for a right relationship. Both are required for me to worship the Lord in genuine faith. Jesus is calling her to embrace the truth and receive the Spirit. Salvation is not in a religious experience. It's not in a church service or an ancient water well. Salvation is not found at the temple. It is found at the cross. And so entrusting the truth and receiving the Spirit 
we then can worship the Lord. It's not about a location. It's about what's happening in here. Jesus says to her, I know you and I love you. I know all about you and I still love you. Would you receive that I am the truth and would you then receive the spirit? He's the cup she needs to drink. He's the hope of the world and for her. Scene three, the call. So the story concludes, the disciples return to the well, verse 27, and they come back and they marveled at what uh, he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left the water jar and went away to the town to the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did, can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Two very different perspectives here. The disciples were marveled at Jesus, the fact that he was talking to a woman, but they didn't speak to the woman. They didn't ask her, hey, why are you here? They were confused. They didn't ask Jesus, why are you talking to her? They just kind of dismissed it like it wasn't a big deal. Now, on the opposite side, the woman was so radically overwhelmed by her encounter with Christ that she immediately takes off and begins to tell everyone she knows. One is rather melancholy, the other is on mission. Can I just tell you, church people, we miss it sometimes? Church people, we miss it sometimes. We're the disciples coming back to this interaction and we're, we're not concerned about what Christ is doing. We're not concerned about the issue this woman is having. What we're concerned about, we'll find out in a second, is that it's lunchtime. One is so focused on the mundane and the melancholy. The other is so focused on being on mission. And so she goes. She takes some risks. She leaves her water pot. She's willing to risk loss. She faces her community. She's willing to risk embarrassment and ridicule and shame. And it begs the question, am I urgently on mission? Or am I just concerned about the mundane? Verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples are urging him, Rabbi, eat, because that's the most important part of the day. Re Rabbi, eat, verse 32. But he said to them, I have no food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet four months and comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. And see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Verse 37. For here the saying holds true. One souls and other reaps. I sent you to reap for what you did not labor. Others have labored and have not entered into their labor. Verse 31. The priority of the disciples was not the priority of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to let life get in the way. I'm so focused on the mission I don't want to stop and eat. It demonstrates the urgency of the gospel. And you know what? Jesus calls us to urgency. He mentions the harvest, those who reap hard before the time of the harvest. Time is short. We got a lot done because the hour is coming. And it reminds the disciples that they got to get to work too. Verse 39, and we'll finish the story. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And some more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Pretty big impact all because of a conversation at a well. She goes, she shares her testimony. She shared what Jesus did. She shares with anyone who will listen, and she invited others to see Jesus. You know what? That's a, a really simple three-part way for incredible evangelism. Share your testimony to anyone who will listen and invite them to hear and know more about Jesus. It's not rocket science. It's rather simple. Their encounter to hear Jesus, many believe, they come, they hear Christ, and they not only believe because of her, but they believe because of Jesus' teaching. And it kind of reminds me, when's the last time I invited someone to church? Part of our role here is it just to come and sing and, and to feel good and be in community with one another and to have our needs met and 
to, to be excited about what's going out in the rest of the week, but we must invite others to hear the message that we have found ourselves. What a challenge for us today. So they accepted the truth of Christ, they received the Spirit, and in doing so, they claimed Jesus to be Savior of the world. Giving Jesus this title embarks Jesus on this mission worldwide, away from the Jews, now into Samaria among the Gentiles. And I'm just afraid some of us are missing it, like the disciples. People all around us are chasing satisfaction, and we have the answer. It's time for us to get on mission. And I would say for you today, if you feel like a disciple, get on the mission. Stop chasing the mundane and the melancholy. If you today might find yourself more like this woman, shame and guilt have infiltrated you and kept you from finding Jesus to be the quencher of your thirst, and you're drinking every cup you can imagine, can I just tell you today, don't stay parched. Drink the living water in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, you are good and kind, and in this moment, I simply want to pray that we would be responsive. In a moment, we're going to sing. In a moment, we're going to have pastors at the back doors, pastors up here, pastors in the balcony, ready to receive anyone who would just say, you know, I need prayer today. Maybe they would come and they would say, you know, I, I'm the Samaritan woman. I've got unconfessed sin in my life, and it's keeping me from following Christ. It's keeping me from really having satisfaction. I've come here today realizing that Jesus is the only cup that I can drink that's going to satisfy my soul. It could be you want to come share that with one of our pastors. We're just going to pray with you. We're going to give you some, some tools, some answers. It could be that the reason you're doing that is because you don't know Christ as your Savior. And I would just simply tell you, these guys at these doors are going to be overjoyed for the opportunity for you to talk with them about that. And there could be others in the room, believers, who see this woman whose life has radically changed and it puts them to shame for how little they're doing to help others know the wonderful power of Jesus. We've got a culture chasing things, a culture drinking cups, thinking that's going to find them satisfaction and happiness and contentment, and the truth is it's only Christ. We as Christians, we, we make mistakes. The church makes mistakes. It's only Christ that's perfect. It's only Christ that will satisfy. So this morning, as we pray, just ask the Lord to reveal to you, what are you chasing? What are you seeking? What are you trying to quench your thirst with? Would you offer that up to the Lord this morning? Would you find confession to be the vehicle for freedom this morning? Would you allow the Lord to satisfy you today? So, Father, all across this room, we're praying this morning. We're asking, Lord, you do the work. We're asking for courage and strength to respond to you. And as we sing this morning, Father, I pray that, Lord, we just be reminded of your great, wonderful faith, wonderful love for us, despite who we are, despite what we've done. The cross is for us. Your cup is for us. Your love is for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand this morning. Let's sing together. song. 
waves and not the sinking sand of anything this world has to offer, saying, I will build my life. Remember, there's going to be a Gideon table out in the lobby. A portion of today's offering will go to help support the Gideons. We just want to invite you to be a part of that ministry as best you can. Let's watch and look and read with me the benediction for today. Let us be reminded of God's incredible love towards us despite our sins and failures. Let us be reminded of his grace and kindness to us and to all people. To the wealthy or poor, the saint or the sinner, grant us many opportunities and bold courage to share with others what you've done in our lives so that others may know you as Savior. And God's people said, amen. amen. You're dismissed today. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. My name is Pastor Adam Miller. I'm the Mission Mobilization Pastor here. And one of the greatest things that our church loves to do is to connect with people. And so whether you're watching online in your home or whether you're listening to this as you're driving, we wanna know who you are. And the best way to do that is to either scan this QR code or go to gsfpc.org slash check-in. It's our heart to connect you to Christ and then also connect you to the body of Christ. So we'd also like for you to join us in person at 9.30 in the Worship Center every single Sunday. We hope to see you there.